Internet freedom for global development. Are we making progress? What are the takeaway messages from the Stockholm Internet Forum and are these dialogues valuable? Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's great to see so many of you have stayed with the program even after lunch on the last day. And quite right too, because I think we have a wonderful, exciting panel uh, for us all. But uh, as before, this is an interactive conference that we have the Twitter feed, we have our remote moderator, and I'm going to be coming out and asking for contributions from you uh, at an early stage as we cover the various themes. So uh, one thing I wanted to start with, I want to set you some homework to do straight away, is that we're at the end of a two-day conference. Many of you have traveled thousands of miles and many hours to get here. If it's true, that the best way to govern the internet is through multi-stakeholder mechanisms. That means that each and every one of us has a role to play. So what I want you to do now is to think about the one thing you personally commit to do as a result of this conference uh, to further the cause of internet freedom. And I want you to tweet it using the hashtag SIF13. And if you're a government person and you're not on Twitter, then maybe use a piece of paper. But let's get the, the, the dialogue going, and, and we'll come back to the remote moderator to see what we're all committing to do. And maybe the panelists can think about that too. So I'm going to introduce our panel. On my right, your left, is Ioane Sanchez, journalist, blogger of Generation Y from Cuba. Uh, I think she needs very little introduction from me, um, except to say that she has more Twitter followers than Fidel Castro himself. Uh, Ioani will be speaking through an interpreter today, Renata Avila, who I'm sure you will remember with great warmth from uh, earlier sessions. Further on, uh, we have Minister Gunilla Carson, uh, the Minister for International Development Cooperation here in Sweden. Welcome. Then we have Andrew Wyckoff, the, um, the um, Director of the Directorate for Science and Technology and Industry at the OECD. Hope I've got that right. Then welcome to Dr. Sangyal Nam, who's a research fellow at the Korean Information Society uh, Development I Institute. And one of the, which is co organizing the SAIL conference later this year. Then I have Carlos Afonso Souza, vice coordinator for the Center of Technology and Society in Brazil. And last but certainly not least, welcome to Sylvie Coudre, chief of section for freedom of expression at UNESCO. So, We've been talking in the last couple of days about internet freedom. Ioanni Sanchez, I would like to ask you what we mean by, or what this means to you. What would need to be in place? What building blocks would need to be there for there to be internet freedom from your point of view? Sí, bueno, primero buenas tardes. Gracias por la invitación a este lugar y gracias a Renata. Uh, first, good afternoon. Uh, thank you for the invitation to this place and thanks to me. <laughs> ¿Qué significa la libertad de Internet para una persona que vive en el país del hemisferio occidental con menor conexión a Internet? What does Internet freedom mean uh, for a person living in the uh, country with the lowest uh, connectivity in the Western Hemisphere? Pues significa ese horizonte inalcanzable, esa, ese reto, ese sueño por el que cada día nos enfrentamos a muchos obstáculos materiales, pero también a muchos obstáculos políticos y de censura. Well, so it means that that, that horizon, uh, hard to reach, that hope, that desire uh, for uh, the one that we uh, face many, many, many challenges, not only uh, technical challenges, but also uh, political challenges every day. 
Alcanzar la libertad de acceso a Internet en Cuba se ha convertido hoy en día en uno de los pilares fundamentales para alcanzar también una transición democrática en Cuba. Uh, achieving this, achieving Internet freedom in Cuba has become one of the highest challenges we are facing. Uh, it, is, it is also one of the most important, uh, one of the key elements, one of the cornerstones uh, to achieve a, a democratic transition. Porque no es solamente la libertad para acceder físicamente, el acto de poder, por ejemplo, ir a una oficina y contratar una conexión doméstica de internet, que en estos momentos es imposible en la isla. So, it is not only the, the technical challenge of just going to an office and, and, and uh, just uh, asking for access to a service and paying for a service to have a internet connection at your home. Currently, uh, at this moment, that is not possible. La libertad de Internet sería también poder acceder a todo el contenido de Internet sin una censura de corte ideológico ni político. Uh, so, Internet freedom means uh, being able to access all contents available on the Internet without uh, filtering or, or censoring uh, uh, because of ideologies or because of political uh, purposes. Pero también la libertad de Internet incluye el poder publicar en Internet las opiniones sin recibir una represalia en la vida real, ¿no? Internet freedom also means being able to publish whatever you want without, without uh, being uh, harassed or repressed. Estamos muy lejos de lograrla, ¿no? We are very far from achieving this. En primer lugar, en Cuba hay serias limitaciones para acceder a la infraestructura que nos podría llevar a Internet como un simple ordenador, ¿no? Uh, first of all, uh, we are facing... Uh, hard limitations in Cuba to access uh, the physical uh, infrastructure uh, that makes possible for us to access the internet, for example, uh, uh, buying a computer. En un país donde el salario promedio mensual no supera los 20 dólares, comprar un ordenador que está sobre los 500 es un sueño inalcanzable para muchos, ¿no? So, the impossible dream for a Cuban is to buy a computer because uh, the, the average income per month is 20 dólares. And uh, to buy a computer, it will cost $500. Acceder a una hora de acceso a Internet, a, de conexión a Internet desde un hotel, única posibilidad ahora mismo para un ciudadano políticamente no correcto. Mm -hmm. eh, acceder desde un hotel cuesta una hora entre 6 y 12 dólares. También para ese mismo ciudadano que tiene un salario de 20 dólares al mes. ¿no? So, if you are a political dissident and you can, you want to freely access the internet uh, in Cuba, the only possibility is to do it uh, uh, by an hour in a hotel that will cost uh, one hour between six and twelve dollars, and that uh, for a political dissident uh, whose average income is twenty dollars is. Así, así que si pudiera definir en dos grandes grupos los problemas que enfrentamos las personas en Cuba que queremos ser internautas, los dividiría en un grupo que incluye los problemas materiales, el acceso a un ordenador, las altas tarifas de conectividad, la imposibilidad de conexiones domésticas y en otro grupo todo lo que tiene que ver con la censura. So I will uh, divide the obstacles in Cuba to access the internet in two groups. The first group will be uh, the access, technical access. So you do not have connectivity, it's very expensive. Um, uh, you cannot access it at home. And uh, the access itself is very uh, slow. And in, on the other side, you have all the political issues, like all the political obstacles to access the internet. Yes. Sin embargo, hay motivos para la esperanza. However, there's hope. There is hope. En Cuba hay un mercado ilegal de información, de páginas copiadas de Internet, de material audiovisual sacado de la red, que les sorprendería a todos ustedes. So, uh, in Cuba, you will be surprised. There's a, a parallel illegal market of contents, of pages, of uh, websites already downloaded, of materials, of movies and audiovisual material already available there. En Cuba somos especialistas en buscar todo lo que está racionado o prohibido. So we are, uh, in Cuba, we are uh, 
very good at looking for alternatives for everything that is forbidden or, or it's scarce. Así que como mismo nos sumergimos cada día en el mercado ilegal para buscar leche para nuestros hijos, nos sumergimos también en ese mercado ilegal para buscar información. So we uh, every in in our uh, daily life we might uh, look for alternatives in the illegal market to find milk for our children. Eso But we lo... also will we also will find alternatives to, to, to internet material and, and content. Eso es lo que llamamos la internet sin internet. Y en eso, en eso somos especialistas. So that's what we call the internet without the internet. And we are very specialists at this. Yeah. So c tell me about the internet without the internet. Because I think that what, what, so what we're hearing from you is that the, the freedom, you know, and this is something that echoes remarks made from the audience earlier in, throughout these two days. Without basic access, it's all very well and good to speak about freedom. So the first thing is the freedom to connect uh, at a price that isn't punitive, and then the freedom to express yourself. And uh, the, the, what you're describing is a, a group of the internet without the internet. Could, could you just uh, very quickly let us know what you mean by the internet without the internet. And then I want to come Is to the audience about uh, uh, what you think we're talking about when we talk about internet freedom, which is, after all, the uh, title of this conference. So, so that, anybody wanting to... Yes, sir. Can we get a microphone yes. down here? So we're asking, what do you mean by... Uh, internet freedom, because I, I'm not sure that we've defined that term. I don't want to get too bogged down, but what we're hearing from Ioanni Sanchez is a multi-layered sort of building blocks, in a way. Uh, Rajesh Charya, President, ISP Association of India. A country with a very diversified system, different, different religions, different, different culture, and different, different society. From last two days, we are discussing about the freedom First, I want to know from the panelists, what is the definition of the freedom? How you are going to define the freedom? What is the freedom for the developed country? What is the freedom for the developing country? And what is the freedom for an underdeveloped country? And from what's, your, what's your definition? My definition is entirely different. In my opinion, self-regulation is the best regulation. Mm -hmm. Nobody should control, but at the same time, we should not speak of freedom so loud that it is going to hurt the religion or the society or one section of the society of any country. Sylvie Coudray, could I turn to you? Sylvie Coudray from the Freedom of Expression Unit at UNESCO. Uh, what do you think uh, internet freedom means? And does it have any limits? Uh, a lot of questions. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, internet freedom, and to a certain extent, I'm going also to reply to, to Mr. Um, I think it's um, uh, free, um, free internet uh, is a link to the right-based uh, approach. It means concretely that uh, the full range of uh, human rights should be the normative foundation for internet. And when I'm speaking of freedom of expression, I'm referring, obviously, to Article 19 of Human Rights, uh, Universal Human Rights Declaration. And I, I'm also referring to uh, this declaration because it contains all human rights, meaning uh, education, meaning religion, meaning uh, access, meaning uh, freedom of expression and press freedom. So all these uh, rights which are contained uh, in uh, the... Uh, Universal Declaration of uh, Human Rights uh, are interdependent and uh, interlinked and are the base of uh, Internet. So does anybody disagree with that from the audience? Show of hands. Do you care? <laughs> I think we all care about it. But so that, Sylvie, you're describing on, the, on behalf of UNESCO a, a rights-based approach, very much referring to the Universal Declaration. And I saw lots of nods on the panel. Dr. Nam, did you want to intervene? Yes, first of all, uh, I'd like to thank for this uh, uh, great opportunity. Uh, I'm 
before, before I begin, I, I'd like to mention that this is my own personal view, not necessarily from, uh, consistent with our government uh, viewpoint. And I agree with you. And I'd also like to emphasize the uh, economic, economist point of view in terms of uh, uh, freedom uh, in internet. That means uh, freedom from uh, various barriers to access uh, internet and also uh, some freedom from uh, use in the internet and also some uh, human skill to utilize the internet. That means uh, we need to equip uh, good infrastructure, also good institution related to internet and also uh, some services, contents, and also uh, human skill to mm -hmm. fully utilize that uh, services and uh, infrastructure. Thank you. Thank you. Carlos Afonso. Hey, if, I, if I can just jump in and not giving the impression that every time you get an economist speaking, you get to have like the lawyer speaking right after that. But, uh, but I'm a lawyer by but training. But here you go. Yeah, <laughs> so, but like there we go, reinforcing stereotypes. Uh, but like uh, one thing that it's, I think it's curious about the, the very expression of internet freedom is that sometimes when we think about freedom, we think about it, freedom is to be free from law. Freedom means, uh, and just to jump in in the contribution that we got from, from, from the audience, sometimes we think that in order to be free, you don't need a legislation or a law whatsoever that could dictate or regulate a specific conduct. In that case, and the situation that we are seeing now with uh, internet itself, is this growing regulation of internet in so many aspects, which comes to the situation in which it seems, at least to me, that in order to get internet freedom, you not need to be free from law, but you need to be free because of the law. So we need a legislation and we regulation that would improve, enforce, and foster those freedoms rather than simply said, let technology run from itself and we will all be good with that. But so it, if I can just ask you, push you a little bit on this. You're talking about freedom not meaning an absence of all regulation, not meaning yep. an absence of all rules, a sort of eat as much as you like type of thing, mm -hmm. but actually some fairly structured... I mean, it's something that strikes me visiting here in Sweden, uh, which epitomizes to many people a lot of freedom, a, a great tradition of freedom and freedom of expression, how incredibly well-ordered the society is, perhaps with some exceptions at the moment, but, you know, this, that this is not about building a society with no rules, and so the freedom has some structures around it. Is this what you're saying? Yes, exactly. So that's why I think we need to pay attention on this moment in which a number of countries are regulating internet in so many aspects, and especially on our region, on Latin America, we're going through the situation in which, for some countries, the very first laws about internet are being created nowadays. So mm -hmm. this is the moment in which we need to focus on those countries. And if I just could add just a little bit, I think we could hear from other panelists yeah. about uh, like... Uh, a, how the experience of regulating on those uh, aspects of internet end up being experienced in other countries as well. Well, but maybe on that note, I can, can move to Minister Carlson. Uh, we're talking about what we mean by internet freedom, and I'd like to hear from you, and also how we strengthen uh, development through freedom. What it, can, you, can you help us make this link again? Uh, it's not obvious to everybody. Yeah, but I, I, I think the starting point and the entry point for many, I think it has been like where we started today. I mean, the, the right to engage, to take responsibility. You could also say that one part of freedom is also that you carry rights and you're thereby also acting responsible. And what I sense is important to say today, I mean, Amnesty today launched its yearly report and saying that in their description, and I, I fully agree with this, that internet is the tool to help us to fulfill the freedoms of organizing ourselves even better in a new world because we can really reach out and to see that more pe people can take part. So to me, it's 
both the rights but also the opportunity that lies with this. Mm. And thereby also seeing that I think the, what's frightening here for governments, and I think it was elaborated upon this morning where some of uh, a, a person for Uganda, sorry I didn't get your name, said just that it opened up governments and it's empowering people. And I think that's what it is about. You have now much better opportunities to empowering people to take part. Mm. And for many governments that should be a good thing. And that should also help spur economic development. It's not just only a right in itself and a freedom. It's also a great opportunity to organize yourselves much better, much smarter, much more sustainable, mm. and uh, also much more inclusive. But and that's why we have to also move to the economic part of this. Because when you are stopped to limiting this opportunity, and I can understand that some governments are afraid of this, but then they are also losing out a lot of opportunities to see that this is also a tool to engaging with people to make them be part of their own development and thereby de developing their own societies. So but to me, I it's also a question about not only rights and freedoms, it's also of access. Yes, yes, and, and, and we heard that very, very clearly from Ioanni Sanchez. The one thing that I think I've sort of picked up a ripple of amongst uh, the attendees here is a sense of sort of like, well, is this just you know, rich developed countries preaching to developing countries about how they should behave. And, you know, we heard in the opening session, uh, Carl Bildt saying it's okay for us to do surveillance because we're good and, you know, bad countries shouldn't be doing surveillance or that might be an unfair uh, 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 summary. But I think that that was, that was uh, uh, what I heard anyway. And I'd just like to hear your response to that. Do, do you agree? Well, I, I think you probably made a very short uh, translation into what I think he was actually saying. I, I mean, <laughs> so help us out. What, what was he? I, I think there is some fundamental differences if you are in a in a in a country uh, governed by the rule of law and where you have democra democracy and where we have these laws made up in a democratic order, uh, where where they are also scrutinized by a free media and where where it can be be uh, really analyzed yes. and discussed and debated. And that's the good thing, because I think there is also a balance that you dealt with yesterday about security and freedoms. But just to take this to another level, know that this is the great opportunity, I think, for low and middle income countries. When you have seen the empowering of people and really using the opportunities with, with information and communication technologies and the, the access to information and the pluralism, but also the economic opportunities to make people much more capable of, of developing themselves. So it must be also, of course, from a national basis where you analyze this and drive it from a context where you also can see that there could be so much of smart innovations and developments, thanks to that you also give the power to the people on the ground. And thereby, I think we have a lot of opportunities for investments, whether it's in health, or in, in, in new products or services that we don't know yet know of. Yes. And here lies a fantastic opportunity for those countries that are today conceived as poor, because yes. they can leapfrogging in technology, and I see it myself, for example, in Africa, where I travel quite a lot. This pride also in being part of development, thanks to the new technologies, should also be realized and, and understood, and I think engaging in these days. But without the freedom of the internet, this will be not as dynamic as it could be. And that's why we have to protect the freedom of the internet, but also to move the debate, I think, to the great economic potential, not at least for those that are not yet empowered. Thank you. Andrew Wyckoff from the OECD. What's your comment on the meaning of internet freedom and the linkages towards development? Yeah, thank, thank you, Emily. Um, I think I take a similar position as Dr. Nam in terms of the uh, internet freedom, I look at it from an economic perspective, and it goes to things like, well, it's freedom to innovate, and the f freedom to educate oneself o over the, the internet as well. But you look at modern economies, whether they are in the OECD world or outside, in the southern world, it, it doesn't matter. It, increasingly, these are knowledge-based economies. It's how agriculture works, it's how uh, many uh, resource-dependent uh, uh, countries need information to make these markets uh, act well. And without that information, 
you're shooting yourself in the foot, along with development as it goes forward in the 21st century. But, but as, we, as we see from Yoni Sanchez's experience, the freedom to speak the truth or to say things is, causes quite a lot of fear and causes quite a lot of ripples as well. So what would you say to, to countries that are, are feeling a bit fearful at the moment at the thought of freedom? I think that's where conferences like this one and the leadership of Sweden that is, that is portraying throughout the world here are important because it emboldens people to fight back against that and to show that that is a negative strategy that won't work in the long term. It won't hurt politically, but it will hurt you economically, uh, fundamentally. And I think that's, this is why we need to keep this, this dialogue going. Can we hear from, does anybody in the audience want to join in this discussion? Yes, can we get a, a microphone there, please? Anybody else? My name is Lilia Osleti, and I'm from Tunisia. Um, first, for Yoni, Yoni uh, I'm really happy to see her live. It's, it's uh, really an honor. And uh, um, is to say, there are uh, Mr. Carlos Alfonso, he said that uh, internet freedom is not freedom without laws, but freedom within laws. So I'm not really uh, OK with this. For example, a UNE can have a lot of problem in her country because they're low. Julian Assange too have a lot of problem because of law. The, 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 the law for me, in my perspective, it's universal law, freedom, for, uh, ex freedom of expression have to be the base for everything. And some laws are against the universal law. So, we don't have to forget this. And uh, freedom of expression, we, if we don't have freedom of expression, we are completely like with a body without oxygen and we are dead. We can be like a zombie. So really, it's very important to have freedom of expression, even if the law is not uh, okay with it. Thank you very much for that point. Sylvie Coudray from UNESCO. Just a quick reaction, uh, if and you have... So, sorry, Sylvie, can we get a microphone to this lady at the front? Please carry on. If you have a, a human rights-based approach vis-à-vis uh, -vis Internet, it means that if you have a law, this law should meet international standards. It means that it should be legitimate, it should be proportionate, and of course it should meet uh, democratic uh, uh, standards. So I don't think we should be against laws, in principle, uh, we cannot live without laws. Uh, but of course, uh, it, me it, it means that it has to uh, meet international standards. Thank and you. the second thing I wanted to say to react vis a vis the access, when we are speaking of access, um, you have the connectivity, the physical access, but also it means access uh, uh, covers a lot of issues, such as uh, the languages, such as uh, the gender, such as uh, the voiceless, if I can say like that. So it means a lot of uh, the notion of access. Thank you. Madam? I think it, it should come on if you just speak. Hello. Yeah, Hello. my name is Jahan. I'm from Pakistan. And um, I think it's very dangerous when we say that we, when we empower governments with the right to protect the sentiments of people and decide what should be available in terms of content on the internet, that this is going to affect the sentiments of this branch of people or that branch of people. I think society teaches us that, how we should behave with one, one another. And I don't think we should give away that right to our government so that they can decide how it is right for us to behave. As long as we are not breaking the law, let's not give away the rights that we have because then that's very dangerous. Thank you. M Minister Carlson, do you have a response to this? No, I, I fully agree with both. I mean, the, the fundamental UN Declaration of Human Rights and, and what we are discussing here is really freedom of expression, freedom to engage, and I think also to arrange and to, to rally around things. It's a fundament for us. And I think also here in Sweden, I mean, our laws on this area when it comes to freedom of expression and, and the freedom of media dates back to the 18th century. Mm -hmm. And it has served us so very well to continue to develop and to, 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 to embrace also new opportunities and also challenges within our society. Uh, so it's also about 
letting people have access to the information free, and thereby also, and that's what I meant with, if you have rights, and if they are respected by the law and guaranteed that you have individual rights and freedoms, and if you know you have rights, you also have responsibility as a person, as a legislator, as a businessman, or well, whatever. With rights comes responsibilities. But you can't re regulate that, you see what I mean? Mm -hmm. So that was my full point. We should have a free internet and access to it for as many people as possible. And that's what I wanted to come to this panel about. How can we see that these people that are not yet connected can be empowered? And also that it is affordable. And where is the role for governments here to see that even more people can have access to a good internet with mm -hmm. the capacity to also develop businesses, thinking, and new knowledge? And that, I think, is now the opportunity and the challenging in, in many low- and middle-income countries and where their uh, governments have to understand that to open up even more, to make economic reforms, but also political reforms, to see that you can be part of a globalized world that are very, very much making good use of the new technologies. Thank you. I want to move to the remote moderator, JJ. First of all, uh, have we got any commitments from people about what they're going to do? Do we have any commitments? Of course we have. Um, but first off, the online audience is having some kind of CIF 13 separation angst. They're already, you know, they're already missing the conference. But they say they couldn't be, they couldn't wish for a better panel to do the wrap up. And everyone is so inspired to see Johannes Sanchez in the panel as well. But then some commitments. Well, first of all, we have the skeptics. So we have Seedbed, who said, I'll commit to remain skeptical about proposals made by big companies and governments. We have Rasha Abdullah, who said, don't tolerate double standards on the part of governments and corporations. Uh, we have the fighters, um, fight for the right to privacy and anonymity online. Um, uh, and we have, you know, some more technical uh, issues as well. I commit to continuing to work for open access, innovation and inclusivity in Pakistan and the developing world. Let us make a difference. Uh, Griffina says, we'll invest in following up on all the great project ideas and uh, that materialized from rich conversations and networking. I think networking is an important part of this. And uh, finally, a very concrete suggestion from uh, Anselme Vimje, who says, we'll start by getting local media involved in informing people about internet and opportunity it gives for better governance. Yeah. Can I just pose a question to particularly to the skeptics and turn it back to you and say, what are you going to actually do or change yourself? I mean, we are surrounded by so much failure if we choose to look at it through that lens. But if we can have your honey Sanchez here on the, on the panel talking about hope, can we all be a bit inspired by that and think about what we're going to do? Um, so, talking of uh, slogans, let's move on to uh, multi-stakeholder governance, which is something that we've heard a lot about in the last couple of days. So, um, again, I want to just sort of Thinking about the way forward, a lot of people, the OECD has as uh, championed multi-stakeholderism as the way to do internet governance. And I just, again, I want to, to ask really, what does this mean? Is this a, a construct of developed countries? Do, do people really believe in it? Or is this a slogan that allows us to go, you know, this is a bit like sliced bread or something. We've got it. Everything's fine, please don't in inquire anymore. I'd like to hear from you about who, how does it work? How does, it, how, do we, how does multi stakeholder governance enable us to make better decisions than not? And Andrew Wyckoff, can you yep. lead us on this, please? I, I'd be happy to. And I just want to start off with we keep talking about the internet like it's a single thing, and it's not. It's not like a telephone system with a circuit switch and the intelligence in the middle. It is a constellation of different technologies and software and communication and IT coming together. And there's layer upon layer upon layer. And the reason I say this is because there's so many actors involved in putting together the internet that it has to be a multi-stakeholder process. It's not just one monopoly turning on a switch giving you telephony. Mm -hmm. And that's why the analogy between the telephony regulated world and the internet regulated world is a very weak one in my mind. And why multi-stakeholderism is the way to go. We've been doing multi-stakeholderism 
since 1998, we held a conference in Ottawa, uh, Canada in that year on, on the internet. Uh, in 2008, uh, we formally put multi-stakeholder representatives around our tables at the OECD. We have civil society, we have organized labor, we have the business community, and we have the internet technical community sitting at the table, reading the documents, debating the topics at the OECD. Is this easy? No, it's not. Does it, it scale? Messy. You what? know, because, you know, let's, uh, uh, you say that the analogies between internet and telephony, they, they don't get us very far, but there are a lot of analogies between the complexity of offline life and the complexity of the internet. Now, we yeah. don't all run our governments. We don't all do every aspect of running offline life because we want to actually live as well. We don't, we delegate other people to do that. And does multi-stakeholder governance, so there's the sitting around having awkward conversations, I get that. What about, what are the roles and responsibilities? Who makes decisions and how? So just quickly, I, yes. I, 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 I was getting there. Just, they Sorry. sit at the table, they contribute to the debate, but at the end of the day, it is those elected representatives who are delegates to the OECD who make decisions and who agree on things. Now, uh, so it's, it's, it's multi-stakeholder participation, but it's not co-decision co making. Uh, and so in, in that regard, it goes, goes to your point. At the end of the day, it's the elected representatives that need to make some tough decisions. Uh, and, but so far, it's worked reasonably well. Uh, we continue to experiment with it. But as I said, it's not easy. But I don't think it's something just for the rich, developed world. It, it can be, it is a model that I think that can extend out to uh, all countries. The problem is, particularly on the civil society side, where they need support, and it's difficult because they don't have, say, the profits that come in to, to businesses to, to send to them. And, and that's a problem I think we need to collectively work on. Thank you. Carlos Afonso, do you have a response or a reaction to that? Um, just to give like a, two very quick examples from what we have in the national scenario and in Brazil. When we think about internet governance in Brazil, our own Brazilian Internet Steering Committee is a multi-stakeholder body and is uh, an experience that is uh, more than 10 years old now, and it's definitely something that we could look at with its advantages and, of course, its flaws. It's really interesting to have a truly multi-stakeholder body being the one who runs the standards and give councils out on regulations for the Brazilian internet. And the other example that I could bring out from Brazil is the one that we call the Marco Civil. I know that Marco Civil probably doesn't mean anything, but like a Marco, it's M-A-R-C-O. Uh, we could translate it as a civil rights framework for the Brazilian internet, which was the first legislation that was created in Brazil in a, I would say, sort of collaborative way, since we end up creating this very simple WordPress website in which people could contribute to the topics that could be inserted in this legislation. And after that, after we got the wording of this uh, soon-to-be bill of law, people started to revise and contribute on the actual wording of the law, we got like uh, more than 2,000 uh, contributions on that. And once this bill of law was sent to the Congress, this very uh, interesting situation happened because the deputy who was the rapporteur of this uh, bill of law in the Congress, first of all, it was a very different animal because it was a law that was somewhat created uh, through this collaboration through the internet. But this rapporteur opened up for a number of public audiences and public meetings and asked people to contribute online as well. And his final report on the law, he mentioned every single time that the original text was changed, he mentioned why I changed the, task, the text and whose contribution led me to change the text. So you got some situations in which uh, you say like, this article changed because I had this contribution from this particular uh, entity from civil society, this like uh, broadcasting company, and this guy on Twitter. So it was really uh, funny, and of course, we cannot be naive here because all the political forces will play along on the approval of the law. But it was at, re at, at least interesting to see that in a country that you have the Internet Steering Committee as a multi stakeholder body have this very first project in which a bill of law was sent to the Congress, being created in a collaborative way, and uniting contributions from uh, business sector 
uh, and civil society, academics in a more stakeholder fashion. So it Thank was you. really exciting. A sort of crowdsourced law drafting yep. in a way. I have a question here. Thank you, sir. In the, a question. Allow me to. Please go ahead. Allow me to just take you back to what Mr. Carlson was saying about freedom and responsibility. Can you hold the microphone a little I'm, closer? I'm afraid, first, my name is George Howard, I'm from Jordan. We've just had a conference of the International Press Institute in Amman a few days back. And the focus of the discussion was how responsible can a journalist be? So if the minister means that people who express themselves on the internet have to be responsible, well, there's, there's a very elastic definition of responsibility, just the definition of freedom is also very elastic. Governments, especially in the third world and authoritarian governments, use this term to uh, actually clam on the freedoms of those who are practicing uh, freedom of expression. Now, as far as journalists are concerned, they are the profession is regulated by laws, by ethics, by standards, by codes of honor. Whereas in, on the internet, anybody can be a citizen journalist or just a, an individual. So how would we define those responsibilities? I think this is very much uh, related to our wide address here. Do you the have a, an answer the, for us of how, how do we define those? Yes, but this is what we have to warn against, is that we, we can, as journalists, I'm a journalist myself, we can resort to ethics and standards, but on the internet, I'm afraid we'll have to come up with a different definition, especially where economic development is concerned, where if I oppose what the government stands for, I'm not accused of trying to ruin the economy of the country, I'm not trying, I'm not accused of uh, sedition, I'm not accused of... Uh, dissent and so on. So we have to be very careful with using this term with all due respect to the minister. Thank you. So I've got another question here. Anybody else? So let's get a microphone over here. And then I'm going to come to you, madam. Um, I'm Jacob Akol from South Sudan. Uh, it's not really a question, it's a comment. When we started a Gurtong website 10 years ago, we had a purpose for it. There were people in the diaspora who were divided. Uh, they were fighting among themselves, people in US, in UK, and in Australia. So we set up a website to try to bring them together so that they can discuss. But we soon discovered that they were actually being more divided than they were before. There was fighting going on. On the internet, people were insulting each other, uh, your mother, your daughter, there were threats of even killing. So from there we learned that perhaps what we needed to do with the website is to educate ourselves as to who we are, the people in South Sudan. And we did a research for all our ethnic communities, um, their culture, their language, where they are located, and we posted that. That became the basis of unity, you know, in South Sudan. And today, Guru Tong is seen by people of South Sudan as a uniting website. Can you please take those lessons and yeah. tell lots of other forums that I'm aware of where there isn't the best behavior in the world? Because it, it, is, a, it is a key point, isn't it, that the freedom to express yourself you know, where do you draw the line about, you know, is it okay to insult people? Is it okay to be vicious or threaten them? Would we say that that was freedom of expression, Minister? Thank you, and, and, and thank you for, because I, I wanted to use these expressions that I mainly use back home in Sweden. I said, with rights comes responsibilities. Because I think we have absolutely individual freedoms and rights, and they should be protected by the law. But I think also that no individual can refrain from its responsibilities towards another man or a woman. 
that's my basic fundamental idea about how I like to live my life and also how big parts of Sweden are organized. Because we are a very much right-based society. But we also carry a lot of responsibilities as single individuals here for our civil society, for our elderly or well, whatever. That's what brings this society together. It has served us well. And what I meant with having also the right to have the freedom of expression, it also br brings you responsibility. Because what the Honorable Man said here from, from, from South Sudan, it is that the magnitude of hatred and other things could be even worse on the internet because it can be spread and also could, to be able to take on that responsibility. And that's why we need, that was described here, we need to behave. Yeah. The internet will not solve everything for us. We also have to learn how to, to use it wisely yeah. uh, and to see the potential of what good it can bring, but also that it can, of course, when good comes, it can also be used in a harmful way. And we have to be realistic about that. Yeah. So that's what I meant with having this and I'd like absolute to... freedom of expression and to see how that can be used. Mm -hmm. But also to say that no freedom is, is, is fundamental in that respect. Yes, and I'd like and, to and put that to Yane Sanchez about uh, what and, you and, see and your what I mean. responsibility as being. And that's why we are so happy to have you here, yes. because with our... Other people are protecting our freedoms and fighting for them for our sake, because that's why we also have a responsibility to support them, like Sweden are doing with this development assistance on Cuba, for example, to really see that we can make a difference and we can also be brave, because not only because it makes us feel good, we have that responsibility to see that we can bring a world to a better place with also fighting for others' freedom. And so that at, at a government level, this is a sense of responsibility at an individual level. What do you see the responsibilities being? And I can see that this is that there are many people who want to, to join, so please. Sí, eh, yo quería decir que la responsabilidad se practica y se aprende ejerciendo la responsabilidad, ¿no? I want to say that uh, you uh, uh, practice and you exercise responsibility Y muchos gobiernos totalitarios y gobiernos que controlan el acceso a Internet quieren, antes de permitirnos acceder a la web, convertirnos en unos ciudadanos extremadamente responsables a la hora de buscar contenido. O sea, personas, eh, en ciudadanos que no van a buscar más allá del contenido que el gobierno permita, ¿no? So, uh, what it happens is that uh, some governments and some countries, they want to exercise some kind of preemptive responsibility. So they want to create these responsible uh, citizens with just responsible uh, access to what they define as respons responsible before they even have access to the internet. Pero eso es imposible. Una vez que el ciudadano entra a internet y ve todo el potencial, ya es muy difícil que los gobiernos puedan poner los límites, ¿no? So, so this is very uh, hard to implement because once you access the internet and you realize the potential and the diverse content, then it, it is very hard to restrict again. Y por eso creo que el gobierno cubano ha optado, en nuestro caso, por impedirnos incluso el acceso físico al ciberespacio. That's why I think that the Cuban government has uh, uh, decided to restrict even the, the physical access to the internet. Yeah. I've got lots of people wanting to, to take the floor. Thank you. Madam, and then... I lived in a country that had war. And during the war, there was a case of a picture that was shown online that government soldiers had gone to a place to massacre people. So this picture did the rounds. And when you see such pictures, the next step is for the people whose ethnic group was being killed to arm themselves and start killing the other ethnic group. But under four hours, we traced that image to a go with Google Images and found out that it is not an image from that year. It's an image not from that year and not from my country. It was an, a picture of people who were burnt in a fuel accident, a petrol accident in the Republic of an, in, in another country. So someone of a bad imagination took that picture, put it online, and said the soldiers of this country did this. But because we were all online, we could disprove that. Mm. 
So after the war in Cote d'Ivoire, we decided as users of the internet to give ourselves a charter for good use of the internet. And so we, we learned our lessons of the war. Now we have things we have advised not to do and things we are advised to do, like to promote peace, promote world unity, to promote human dignity, and positive things you can do. And I'd like to suggest that maybe people begin to think of adopting at least minimum um, values, minimum things, as a, not necessarily as a charter, but guidelines yeah. for us. So we're thinking in terms of principles Values. I mean, it's sounding very UNESCO-like to me, these, these sort of these expressions from the audience. Can we have the next speaker, please? And then can we get a microphone up yes. the back for this gentleman up here while this lady is speaking? Thank you. Please my, introduce my yourself. My name is Afra Nasser. I'm uh, from Yemen, uh, but I live in Sweden. I'm a blogger as well, and it's, just, it's such an honor to see Joanna, like, in person. Uh, and I think that we have uh, some kind of similarity between Cuba and Yemen, when it comes to online censorship and, and freedom of expression, and the, the rankings are usually similar. So I'm more interested to know about how do the people in Cuba fight online censorship? And if you can share like just uh, uh, initiatives or anything that the grassroots inside Cuba are doing to fight uh, censorship. Bueno, eh, especialmente eh, con mucha creatividad, ¿no? Especially when we, we are very creative. Por ejemplo, ahora mismo en Cuba hay un fenómeno muy interesante que es el fenómeno Twitter. Twitter por mensajes de solo texto. Twister por SMS. Uh, right now, what we are doing, there, there is a new phenomenon uh, of uh, Twitter via SMS. And that's what we are doing. Se lo recomiendo a todos los presentes en la sala, incluso a los que tienen internet 24 horas, 7 días a la semana. I highly recommend this method for everyone in the audience, even for those of you who had uh, internet access 24-7. La publicación de, a través de mensajes de solo texto de muchos activistas, disidentes y reporteros independientes en Cuba ha sido hoy, es hoy, un duro golpe para el monopolio oficial sobre la información. So it has been, uh, it, it really harmed the information monopoly uh, because uh, journalists, dissidents and activists are uh, constantly publishing information using this uh, Twitter via SMS. Pero también hay muchos trucos como los proxies anónimos que nos permiten entrar a todas las páginas censuradas por el gobierno. Uh, but there are an, another trick, like uh, the access uh, by uh, VPNs and proxies and anonymous proxies that allows us to circumvent uh, censorship and access to uh, page websites that are uh, forbidden for us. Herramientas como Tor, uh, uh, tools like Tor, la lectura a través de los RCS, uh, 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 RSS uh, feeds. Pero lo que mejor funciona y lo que nos permite convertirnos en internautas sin internet es la información que pasa de mano en mano. But what it really uh, empowers us and enables uh, enables us to access the internet is the information that we uh, pass at, uh, from one person to another. El día que se haga un museo de la democracia en Cuba habrá que levantarle un monumento a la memoria flash. <laughs> The day that we uh, uh, create our memory museum in Cuba, I think that a monument must uh, be built uh, dedicated to the USB key. <laughs> Esa es hoy nuestra internet. That, the USB key is our internet today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Please, sir, go ahead. Hello. Yes, I'm Walid al Sakaf, also from Yemen. Um, but I'm talking as a global citizen, and uh, I have noticed that there are some signs now talking about values, talking about principles, talking about guidelines, and that's a dangerous, slippery slope. Very dangerous, because the moment you begin to draw a subjective attitude to how you behave, that is the moment then censorship starts implicitly and, and tr tries to happen. But and then, and then th furthermore, there's also an important thing. Internet is seen as a reflection of society. It's not something separate. It is a reflection of what we do in real life. 
So trying to punish uh, uh, actions online, for example, like hate speech, I'd say the best attitude to hate speech is actually more speech. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Sylvie Coudre, can I ask you for a response to that from yeah. UNESCO? Yeah, the, uh, there were different questions that I, I'm, trying, I'm going to try to, to answer. Concerning uh, Jordan, uh, the, the issues that you raised about responsibility, um, I fully agree with you, uh, Madam Minister, but at the same time, I know in UNESCO we have been very cautious with uh, this world, uh, especially in, uh, press, on press freedom issues. It's true that some governments are using the word responsibility to, to, to put pressure on journalists. So uh, we have tried to develop um, or to support uh, the idea of professional standards, to reinforce and strengthen the professional standards, and of course ethical uh, codes, knowing that UNESCO will never make an ethical code uh, for, for journalists and I would say for any profession, um, but especially for journalists and it has to be done on a self-voluntary basis and by the professionals uh, themselves. Thank you. Concerning uh, the questions um, by Tunisia and Yemen uh, and Côte d'Ivoire, Madame, also, um, they were, it's not new, the idea of having a principle values uh, putting in a, in a charter or in guidelines. Uh, I can tell you uh, this is why it is very important to have a multi-stakeholder approach uh, because it's very delicate, very sensitive and it should not be done either by a government or by an intergovernmental organization uh, or the business company. So there are a lot of reflections by the business, by the corporates themselves, by uh, the users, by the human rights activists and I don't think a universal code could, uh, could, could be applied. Uh, it, will be, it will have to be developed by different uh, stakeholders. Thank you. Can I go to the remote moderator, JJ? What's going on on the feeds at the I, moment? I, I think, Emily, you really got something started with the commitments because they're pouring it, in. In, in, in. Full full disclosure, it wasn't my idea. It was Patrick Falstrom's idea. <laughs> Thank you. Always Patrick Falstrom. Uh, I think my favorite commitment so far is Mohamed Tarake, who says that he will decentralize the entire internet so governments can't regulate it. Now, that's a small task, right? Good. Good luck. <laughs> yeah, good luck. Um, and even if, if most of the crowd out there is, is really cheering you on, there is also some criticism when it comes to terms of vocabulary, for instance. Are we using a lot of fussy words? Uh, someone says that uh, it's Karin Kusina who will work to eradicate cybersecurity from our vocabulary. <laughs> Terms way too generic to be useful, actually even harmful. And cybersecurity has been on a topic of many panels. Well, wasn't there a point. comment on the Twitter feed the other day that if you, if you remove cyber from a sentence and it's nonsense, then you know that what you're saying is nonsense. <laughs> exactly. And I, I think Henriette is, is onto something in that terms as well. When she says, I commit to reading between the lines of warm and fussy slogans like multi-stakeholderism and internet freedom. Comments on that? Thank you. Minister Carlson, you wanted to make a comment. Yes, because I think also what, what's so fantastic today when we are listening to Gianni and that you are a world star and we all can really uh, feel committed and also be, be part of the fight that's going on for all our freedoms is also the power of the new technology. But basically, I think we should go back to how do you, how do you meet with... Uh, undemocratic governments, how do you uh, stop hate speech and so on, and to use more speech. I mean, to go back to that, we can say that this is a new technology, but the basics are still the same. But the magnitude now of knowledge about the freedom fighter from Cuba are much, much bigger than it was before. But the symptoms, the, 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 the fighters have been there always. Yes. But now we can know much more. That's also the potential of a free internet, that we have a responsibility, and that's what I meant. I'm sorry if I was using the wrong word before, but to me, that's my way of thinking. When I know that people are oppressed, I also have a responsibility to act. That's why Swedish development assistance have been very brave. That's why I know about TOUR. That's why I know what we are doing, also diplomatically on Cuba, 
that perhaps shouldn't be done, just in order to see that we are really living up to what we are saying and assuming our responsibilities and using all the tools, the old ones and the new ones, to protect freedoms and to deepening democracy and to see that everyone should have the opportunity and the accesses. And to that is also what I hope we could talk at next Stockholm Internet, uh, Stockholm Internet Forum about how can we have more that have access to a well-functioning free internet in the world so that more people can participate in our discussion online, but also to have the economic opportunities, because that was also mentioned by Joanna. Mm. It's very hard also for some to take part in this new modern fight because they don't even have a device. Yeah. Yes, and, that's, and, that's we've, and we've heard you know, uh, actually quite a lot of frustration from people in the audience, but, um, particularly uh, members uh, uh, of the audience from developing countries And to me, that's both this. economic empowerment and political empowerment. And also, again, where a government can, and sorry again for the word, take on some responsibilities to see that we have much more access to the internet and to see where you have areas where it's not spreading, that we should do more to see that in many of the low- and middle-income countries, governments themselves should do more to open up the internet, but also in our development assistance, to really see where are these pockets where we can do something now to front-load and to see that you have better developments in having more people having access to a free internet yes. in order to deepen democracy, but also to have true development that is sustainable. And Thank I think you. this is also what our discussion are talking yes. about. We started with freedoms, but we also have to enlarge this debate to see that it's also helping with economic empowerment of people. I'm going to move to, to Dr. Nam now. Uh, I, I would like to, you know, we've heard a lot from people about, you know, you think you've hit on the right thing uh, and, and suddenly somebody else says, no, no, we mustn't do that because in the wrong hands these, con these very attractive concepts can be dangerous. Now, we're... The, the things that keep coming up when you talk about freedom, you talk about responsibility, but also about the security. And uh, security has been a theme in, in something that started as the London Conference and will be uh, 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 held in Seoul this year. And perhaps you could help us to unpick these parallel processes and to, to understand the linkages between both. Okay. First of all, I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, multi, multi-stakeholder approach. Uh, of course, I understand uh, multi-stakeholder multi approach is uh, to give uh, further opportunity to participate uh, related uh, stakeholders uh, to be benefited and affected by the changes in the uh, management of global, for example, global uh, internet. Uh, and the key is that, as we have already mentioned, that they need to share the not only benefit, but also the burden of responsibilities uh, thereof. That's the key. And as you already have good understanding about that, uh, it is very <coughs> important, be became much more important because uh, most of traditional uh, means of communication uh, has been uh, integrated, integrating toward the uh, internet protocol basis. That's what I have understand. And uh, for the broad aspect of uh, uh, freedom in internet development and, and so on, uh, I need to emphasize that uh, there is diverse, there are diverse situations uh, in terms of uh, uh, some institutions and also some services and also some uh, human resources. Uh, different societies, different countries has very diverse situation in that sense. And of course, cyberspace, internet, is not independent of reality as a mirror image of uh, uh, reality, actually. So even though cyberspace is open and interconnected, but because of that, we don't expect that the changes we want, such as a very uh, virtue like uh, freedom and human rights, cannot be attained at once. We need to change 
uh, the reality at the same time. Of course, because of the uh, util utilization of uh, internet or IC technology, uh, we can facilitate the changes in reality uh, as we want. want. Uh, that's what we, I understand as uh, uh, cyberspace and uh, the yeah. changes we want to in the reality. But it's, it, I think that's a, a, is a point very well made, is that, that you know, the, the <laughs> offline life, we haven't actually solved a lot of these problems offline. Uh, I think, as, as Minister Carlson said, the benefit of the internet is that we get to hear about things, perhaps. I'm interested in what seems to be developing as two parallel tracks, though. You get human rights people into a room, and they talk about freedom, and you get security people into a room, and they talk about threats. Now, actually, Carl Bildt, in his opening remarks, said that actually security and freedom are two sides of the same coin. Is there any way we can break out of these silos and try to, to combine our conversations a bit? Of course, it's not easy, I suppose, but... Uh, first of all, we need to uh, uh, make a good uh, mutual understanding uh, about the social economic benefits from uh, internet or cyberspace, and then uh, the security issue of cyberspace is uh, a kind of prerequisite or a necessary condition <coughs> to fulfill the benefits of, from uh, social economic aspect. So we need to share uh, the awareness or the value uh, that we can attain from the uh, cyberspace security so they can be, uh, go together uh, to get uh, some benefits from uh, cyberspace and then we need to uh, attain cybersecurity. We need to understand the relationship and share the uh, understanding. That's the starting point, I suppose. Mm. And uh, Carlos Afonso, can I, can I turn to you on this? It sort of brings mm. out the, the discussion we had about multi-stakeholder governance. Uh, how multi-stakeholder is the security dialogue at the moment? Well, that's, uh, that's probably one of the key issues that have been discussed in this, in this meeting. And since this uh, wrap-up panel, uh, I believe, from all the panels that we heard so far, it's uh, quite clear that uh, security or cybersecurity, if, if you wish, it's clearly the less moot stakeholder of all issues on internet governance so far. And that's a scenario that needs to be changed. And we, we've seen in, a, in a, many of the, the, the speakers that have been going through those, those, two, those two days that civil society needs a strategy to tackle cybersecurity, that cybersecurity needs to be more mode stakeholder, and that's definitely uh, a way, of course, in a the more theoretical sense, but that's definitely one bridge to create between those two universes, between threats and between freedoms. And uh, I believe uh, a second concept that was pretty much referred to in uh, a lot of panels is the, the need to define in a little bit more, uh, I would say, in a better sense, what is cybersecurity? Security of what? Security of users, security of the national infrastructure, security of the state organizations. So to densify a little bit the, the very own concept of cybersecurity could look like a theoretical discussion, but it could turn out that it could <coughs> get some very practical results since everyone in the conversation can understand what we are talking about. So what's the, not only the interest is, but as well the results of the discussion on cybersecurity as a whole. Thank you. Can I just sort of uh, pick up a, a point I think was made from one of the pledges about um, single-handedly defending the decentralized nature of the internet? And one of the aspects that, that I, I've heard a lot of sort of Google bashing, <coughs> Facebook bashing, Twitter bashing, but one of the issues that seems to be part of this puzzle is individuals' privacy. And, uh, and you know, the, the scholar Tim Wu talks about the tendency towards monopolization or monopolies that com all communication systems share. And I think 
I would like to ask you and you whether we start, we're starting to see that. We've got the emergence of some very powerful companies. And um, one thing for the Twitter feed, can, can you share the creepiest bit of behavioral advertising that you have experienced recently? You know, our, our, a lot about our habits, our interests, our geographical location, what we've posted, what we're interested in, all of these are known to a few very large companies. Um, and Tim Wu, the, the, uh, the, who's written the Master Switch, has asked what happens when these companies decide to share that information with uh, people without our knowledge. So can you get on with that? Have you got any? Yes, please. Can we get a microphone here and here? Any responses from the panel? Andrew Wyckoff, we haven't heard from you for a while. Yeah, no, I, I, I'd be happy to wade into this swamp. Um, <laughs> we uh, actually worry a lot about privacy at, at the OECD. In 1980, actually, before half this crowd was even born, uh, we put out guidelines uh, that set out transborder data flows and, and privacy rules. And these, these privacy rules actually are under review right now for exactly the reasons that you brought up, Emily. And, and I think we do have to be careful about uh, this surveillance, this big data, uh, too much data being collected on people that they don't know, and they want to opt out. Uh, that's, that's something that we're under review. But I, I just want to put out there as well, there's a positive side to this data too. And so you want to be careful not to throw the baby out with bathwater. And there's some great applications going on, looking at transportation and how to make it much more efficient and decrease the environmental Im impact. Infectious diseases, water use, and, and, and so forth. Uh, drug uh, behaviors and, and how to improve the health system. And so we have to strike the balance. And getting that right uh, won't be easy, but, but I would step back from just uh, paper, uh, you know, casting a, a wide brush stroke and just saying, this is all bad. Mm -hmm. I, I think we, we need to think hard about how to extract uh, the benefits from it why protecting civil liberties and privacy. Thank you. Uh, I've got sort of several hands started waving. Oh, yes. Right. Please go ahead. Keep it nice and brief, everybody, because I want to get through as many people as possible. Thank you. Hi, this is, this is Bertrand Lachapelle from the Internet and Jurisdiction Project. Just one, one note going in the direction of what okay. Leslie Harris encouraged us to do yesterday uh, in introducing nuance. I would, I would like to pick the expression you use, like those companies know about us. There is a distinction between two things that needs to be kept in mind. The automated filtering system that are actually distributing advertisement, which is big data treatment, does not mean that there is a human uh, individual that necessarily tracks everybody to try to please this person. What is at stake is whether the data that is collected for this can be used afterwards or separately to do surveillance. This is a different issue. The notion that there are automatic treatments does not necessarily mean that there is a knowledge in the sense of the uh, personal knowledge about every single of the billion users that a, pl a platform like Facebook uh, has. This is an important distinction. Thank you, sir. And can we get a microphone up at the back? We've got some people up there. And then uh, hello, yes, um, Neal Bol from South Sudan. In fact, uh, since yesterday, we have been discussing the same issues as we are equal, but in my opinion, I think we have to discuss it at a different level. For example, I come from a country where majority of our citizens are sick of, uh, of trauma resulting from war. And, uh, and if you allow them to use the internet to the maximum in the way we are talking here, we will be inciting the, the genocide and, and all of us are going to be the losers. So, for example, I have a newspaper which I own. Sometimes, whenever the political tension rises, we always shut it down, like now it is down. Because I'm not there and nobody can control the big politicians who have a trauma disease. So I think we have to understand a, a particular situation of a specific countries. Otherwise, freedom is needed, but not all the time. And does, it, does that bring out the, the linkages between security and freedoms? Because in, you have to have a basic level of security, like fear from personal well, as, harm. Well, as a journalist, I hate the word security, but responsibility. Thank you. Somebody at the back there? 
Hi. And then can we get a microphone down here too? Thank you. My name is Ziad Abu Zayad. I am from occupied East Jerusalem, Palestine. Uh, I would like to make a comment that is related to security, responsibility, and the uh, freedom of expression that have been discussed. Okay. Uh, you can easily make laws. Uh, for example, at the place that I live in, internet became a place where you can express yourself because you, you lack this right on the street. You are, you are not allowed to, hold, to make this in the street. And even when we practice it through the internet, we can easily see that uh, the Israeli authorities hunt us through the internet and try to get as much information as they want or need, through, whether through Facebook or, or Google easily. And they can even use this uh, data against us in court of law when they consider our uh, political activism illegal and against the law and the national interest of Israel. So easily you can speak about making laws, but uh, the way each country sees the law is different from another. Absolutely. This is one, one thing. The other thing, we, we have been looking in the law in, today and, the, and yesterday about a way to, to find a kind of balance between security and, uh, and freedom of expression, and try, or even to find a side to blame or to, to throw the responsibility on. I believe that we share the responsibility on, th on three sides. The can, first, you, can I just hurry you a yeah, little bit, because I want to get point. to other people. Yes. First side is us, the, the activists and users of, of the internet. We have to continue on reminding the governments where, that there is a kind of a freedom of expression that needs to be protected. Uh, the other side that holds the, the responsibility is what, who, whoever considers uh, himself a, a democratic state or, uh, or community. Because if you talk about democratic norms, you, can, you only can protect them by protecting such, uh, such rights as uh, using the internet. And the third side which uh, holds responsibility is actually the international community, and especially specifically the UN. Maybe passing a resolution would help. It may not uh, oblige the countries to commit to it, because we saw many other resolutions that did not uh, oblige, but at least it would embarrass countries that do not commit to this. And, and we heard at the opening about the, um, the, the Human Rights Council passing just such a resolution, so yes. maybe there's some hope. Thank I've got you. a lady down here at the front, and then I'm going to come back to... Well, I'd like to come back to you very quickly and then uh, spend the last 10 minutes uh, just reflecting on uh, concepts of dissent uh, with Yoani. Please, go ahead. On uh, the whole freedom and security, I wonder how many of you are following the story of SAPS? If you hashtag SAPS, S-A-P-S, it's uh, hacktivism that has gone wrong in South Africa where 16,000 uh, whistleblowers have had their... Um, individual details out in the public, their email addresses, their physical address, um, everything is out in the public. Information that has been gathered since 2005. And all of those people have been put out in the public. And I wonder, in a country where uh, security, I mean, um, uh, crime is so high, what have we done to these 16,000 people who came out to give uh, information in secret and now they're out in public. If you follow the story, it's just now bubbling under. And Thank I wonder you. what the, the backlash of that is going to be. Thank you very much. Anything from the wires? Uh, always, uh, always a lot of stuff from, from online. Uh, like you said, Emily, freedom and threat are two sides of the coin. And someone said, add copyright and IPR to the mix, and it's a total mess. Uh, <laughs> there's also a lot of buzz about what you could call the elephant in the room, which seems to be the experience double standards, where even Sweden has legislation like the FRA law, and as a proposed good government, exports surveillance equipment to proposed bad regimes. So there's a lot of buzz about that. And three more things. First, a commitment. Uh, Muriel says, I commit to going again to Cuba and smuggling in some more devices, and this time I'm going to bring a bunch of Raspberry Pis. <laughs> we have Nurani, who again compliments the panel and says, another multitasking panelist at uh, CIF 13, tweets live from the straight stage, truly interactive, everyone is happy about that. And finally, as, as a thanks from the online crowd to the organizers, to the panel, and last but not least to you, our wonderful moderator, uh, we have uh, Joseph Cherif who says, wrap-up session room packed like all other plenary sessions during CIF 13. This was indeed a successful and challenging conference, so thank you. Thank you. I think that you know, taking, taking the lady's point at the front about, uh, we've heard a lot of people mentioning whistleblowers, and also, of course, dissidents. And the, you know, part of freedom is how we deal with dissidents, how we deal with dissent. 
uh, whether that be in a political environment, in a corporate environment, whatever. And, uh, Ioanni, you've spoken very powerfully about the role of bystanders, the fact that people, for probably very good motivation and wanting to protect you, are sort of like, no, don't give yourself a heart attack talking about all this stuff. You know, there are many forces that conspire to keep people silent and maintain the status quo. And please leave us with a hopeful message here. We're just about to go away from a two two-day conference. There's a lot of despair and frustration out there. Can you help us to understand the importance of hearing the messages of dissent? Bueno, primero, primero debo decir que la experiencia que, no, que voy a narrar no es solo mi experiencia, sino, sino también la de otros muchos tantos bloggers y ciberactivistas que hay en Cuba. ¿no? First of all, I want, uh, the experience I will, I will share with you, with the audience, is not just my personal experience, but the experience of thousands of bloggers and cyber dissidents in Cuba. Personas que por decir su opinión a través de un blog, de una cuenta de Twitter o un espacio digital, enfrentan, entre otros grandes problemas, la vigilancia constante. Uh, uh, I'm talking about people that, because of expressing their opinions online, by a blog, by a Twitter feed and so on, they experience constant permanent surveillance by the government. La intervención de su línea telefónica, por ejemplo. Uh, for example, their telephones are wiretapped. Los operativos policiales muchas veces que salen a la calle. The uh, soft and the police raids in the streets. Los hackeos a sus sitios web. El mío está casi siempre en hackeado, ¿no? Uh, they also experience hacking to their websites or personal accounts. Uh, uh, Joanny Sanchez. Uh, a website is permanently under attack or hacked. No permanentemente, pero muy frecuentemente. Like, not permanently, but very frequently, it's under attack. Y también la, las presiones y las represalias físicas que van desde el golpe hasta el arresto. And also uh, physical uh, persecution that comes from just uh, getting um, a hit to being under arrest. Pero si en algo se ha hecho muy sofisticado el gobierno cubano es en la batalla ideológica en la red. But uh, the Cuban government has become very, very skilled in a different field, and it is the ideological battle using the web as well. El asesinato de la reputación parece ser por el momento el arma más, más utilizada por la propaganda oficial, ¿no? Uh, the assassination of character is the most popular tool right now to attack dissent in Cuba. En lo personal, lo más difícil de llevar no es el golpe físico o pasar una noche, dos noches en un calabozo. Eso para mí no es lo más difícil, ¿no? Personally, uh, the most difficult thing for me to deal with is not uh, spending one or two nights under arrest or uh, being physically harmed, but... Lo más difícil es a veces ver cómo las personas se alejan por miedo al contacto con estos ciberactivistas, cómo se alejan en el mundo físico y real de estas personas, ¿no? Uh, the most difficult thing to deal with is the isolation, is to witness how people uh, avoid you and how people uh, try uh, to avoid any kind of contact with you, both in the physical and the, in, the, in the internet. Como el asesinato de la reputación online termina incidiendo en una especie de muerte social, física. How uh, the assassination of character taking place online and so uh, leads to a, another result that is like the assassination of, uh, of your reputation offline. Así que sufro especialmente cuando algún amigo deja de llamarme, ir a mi casa a visitarme, precisamente porque esa propaganda oficial, ese asesinato de la reputación ha logrado su efecto, ¿no? So I, I particularly suffer when a, a friend of mine stops calling me, stops visiting, visiting me, because uh, the government uh, achieved its intended result. Uh, they achieved the, the isolation the, and the assassination of my reputation. De todas formas, quiero aclarar que hay una gran diferencia entre el ciberactivista, el blogger de la, la capital cubana, de la ciudad de La Habana, y las personas que utilizan esas herramientas en provincia. I, I want to uh, make a, a clear difference here. There's a difference from a, a cyber dissident or blogger using these tools from uh, the capital city in Cuba and the rural uh, and the, the, the people from rural areas in Cuba. 
para ellos las dificultades de acceso son mayores y la represión también. Uh, for them, for rural dissidents in Cuba, uh, the difficulties are greater, greater the access as well. And what, and yet, you carry on. And Continue. what should we all be doing to support people like you in a political environment? I think that the dis the description of assassination of character will be familiar not only in the, the context of political dissidents, but also people in the developed world who are whistleblowers who suffer exactly the same. So how can we assist? What, should we, what actions should we be taking to make your life and people like you easier? Yo recomendaría, la gran recomendación que hago y el gran pedido que le hago a la comunidad virtual internacional que está también representada hoy en esta sala. What I am asking for, for this international community in this uh, room, but also for, uh, to the internet, international community is... Eh, tener en cuenta que ayudar a los cubanos a tener una presencia en internet es ayudarlos a estar protegidos como ciudadanos. Uh, is to consider that helping Cubans to have a presence online is helping Cubans to protect themselves, a their citizenship as well. Quizás no lo crean, pero un retweet, la, la amplificación de un post en un blog, un, una firma que se hace en change.org, eso puede marcar la diferencia entre el arresto o no arresto de un activista, entre el golpe o, no, o, el, o la no existencia del golpe, ¿no? So, you might believe it or not, but just a retweet or republishing an article or signing a petition on uh, change.org might be the difference between being arrested or not, between being physically harmed or not. Por otro lado, si alguno de los aquí presentes viaja un día a Cuba, tiene un amigo un pariente que viaje, llevar algún artilugio tecnológico. Uh, so, if any of you are, are planning to visit Cuba, or any of your relatives or friends are planning to visit Cuba, please bring uh, uh, gadgets, internet devices and equipment. Una laptop que ya no usan, un viejo teléfono que no les interesa, puede hacer que un ciudadano cubano pase del silencio a la opinión, ¿no? Thank you. So, so, your old laptop, a spare telephone, uh, uh, an old device can make the difference between a an offline silent citizen and an online active citizen. Thank you very much. Now in the last <laughs> two and a half minutes, I'd like to turn to the panel and just ask you for your one resolution that you're going to do as a result of this conference to make things better. <clears throat> and I'm going to start with you, Minister Carlson. One thing that you commit to doing. As a person, it doesn't have to be on behalf of anybody. I promised you, Annie, before we enter the scene, that I should go on Twitter. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Andrew? Uh, I've heard so much about access, and it's something we've been involved in for a long time. So I'm going to go back and uh, try to push forward kind of a, a best of, a, a toolkit for how to improve access. Thank you. Dr. Nam. Thank you. Uh, I'd rather uh, uh, recommend that you attend the, the coming uh, Seoul <laughs> Conference on Cyberspace in uh, October, because we, uh, the cyberspace issue is uh, uh, a kind of a living thing. We need to uh, discuss uh, uh, through ongo ongoing process. So please come and join and make a contribution to that. Thank you. Thank you. I think that was a commitment for us, not for you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to let you off. Sure. Carlos Afonso. Well, I could ret retweet some of Ioannis' tweets as uh, one suggestion, but definitely uh, back in Brazil trying to continue this process of engaging users into the way we try to build uh, better regulation that really has a human rights-based uh, approach and really push forward for that. Thank you. Sylvie Coudre. Uh, <clears throat> I want to inform you that uh, the UN group has uh, for Information Society has um, approved that uh, a statement on ICTs are enablers for uh, development. And I think as you have uh, 
raised several times, Madam Minister, I think it is really uh, uh, essential that um, ICTs and Internet freedom uh, are a uh, vehicle for uh, development. And I would like to thank, of course, Sweden. <laughs> thank you. As the representative here from the Swedish government, because I know you're going to wind up. And you have done this beautifully and keeping us on time. It's fantastic. Uh, but also to commit from the Swedish government that we will have a new Stockholm Internet Forum, that we will continue this cooperation and to see that the discussion also can take place live, like we are doing here today. And it will continue tomorrow and perhaps almost the, the next hour uh, online. But I think this gives us a very good opportunity to gather different actors to see how we can share experiences, but also to start to think about all the opportunities that lies out there. This is sponsored by CEDA and our development cooperation. It's my responsibility, and I also think we have a huge potential with empowering people politically and economically with using the full opportunities with information and communication technologies in all its forms. But also to remind ourselves that between these developments are single human beings, wherever they are. And I think the internet gives us a huge opportunity to connect with them. And that's what we are doing here and tomorrow. And that's why I'm happy to see you all again next year in Stockholm. Thank you very much. I think I'm sure you'd all like to thank our panel and thank you to you for your participation. Remember your commitments, dust them down in three months' time and think, how am I doing on that? So I hope to see you next year. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, uh, we are coming very close now to, to, the, to the close of, of this year's Stockholm Internet Forum. Uh, before we do that, and we all go home to our, our different internets around the world, um, please just let me convey a big thanks to all of you who came to Stockholm to participate from, from all over the world, actually. Thank you so much. Give yourself a big hand, please. Thank you. And secondly, uh, sort of a, a collective thanks also to all the moderators and the panelists whom I think have been extraordinarily good. Could you please give them also a big hand of applause? Thank you. Thank you. Um, so before we say goodbye and, and see you again um, and travel safely and all that, uh, I'd like to give um, the microphone to... Olof Ehrenkrona, who is uh, very much in charge of our work of, on the Internet Freedom, and also advisor to the Foreign Minister, to say a few concluding words. Please, Olof. Thank you. Um, the idea behind this forum uh, was originally to, originally to facilitate a truly global multi-stakeholder dialogue on difficult issues related to one of the most profound technological changes so far experienced by mankind. A mankind that has gone from be being local in a linear world to become global in a world of technology that develops exponentially. In one year only we have seen lots of progress but also some setbacks. What I think is quite obvious from the discussions here in Stockholm is that context matters. We have heard a number of evidence of the importance of the overall context in our societies. It's about connectivity online, definitely. But it's not only about connectivity online. It's also about institutions offline. Institutions which we need to, adopt, to adapt to a word online. We talk about the utilization and the consequences of a powerful technology that empowers people, but also empowers governments. The technological change in itself makes it necessary to stress issues of fundamental importance for individual freedom, democracy, human rights, and rule of law. It's a wonderful technology in an open society where freedom, pluralism, and tolerance prevail. But in closed societies, the same technology could be an instrument for oppression. We should never forget that. We, the people, need to control the state, the legislative, the regulatory power, in order to 
secure a free and open internet and cyberspace. This is what the human rights approach really mean. An approach that must be realized by constitutions protecting freedom, democracy and rule of law. Last year when I closed the CIF 12, I said that we will continue our long march through the global institutions together. But as we are moving on, we need also to take hold now and then, to nourish a bit, to get a sense of direction and to find out about the next steps. Looking in order to avoid the obstacles and identifying the opportunities and conveying the message, message to the governments not to be afraid of losing power. They should instead see the new opportunities to gain legitimacy by the new technology. We co-organize this uh, .se, CEDA and the Swedish MFA uh, would very much like to thank the fantastic team behind CIF um, 13. Everyone in the staff, raise your hands if you're here. Everyone else, give them a big hand. I have also, I would like to send a heartfelt thank to some of the most prominent Swedish cyber personalities, the curators on these sessions. I understand that we have had nine million people taking part in this event through Twitter. That's virtually all the Swedish population. But I gather not all of them are a part of the Swedish population. It's truly a very global event. And thank you also to the moderators and the panelists. I have actually never been to an event where one has felt that was enough time for the panels and the, to discuss the subjects. And um, I suppose you have noticed that we, this year we had no keynote speaker, speech, speakers. We prefer to let the floor and the panels have a dialogue and it has worked out fantastically well. And finally, a heartfelt thanks to you participants who have been so energetic and fed so much energy to these discussions. Energy into what is maybe the most important global, global dialogue of our time. We hope that you have felt the warmth and the welcome here in Stockholm. When it, many of us will meet you in the coming year in Geneva, in Tunis, in Lisbon and in Seoul. And of course, in Stockholm next year. Thank you, Minister, for the promise, for the money <laughs> and for your presence. We already had another minister giving a promise yesterday, so we are now two in the Swedish government that will be back for the next year. We will be back next May with the C14. Save the dates. Save the dates in May. But do not spare your energy in the meantime, fighting for a free, open, universal and accessible internet. Thank you.